So why did Western civilization is based on the Bible? It's not, after all, Jewish civilization. Uh, the remarkable fact is that it's based on the Bible because of one particular person, Jesus Christ. It's because Western civilization decided, and for a little while, about 2,000 years actually, did follow Jesus Christ, that everybody read the Bible. But I have to assume, since you're modern people, you went to modern schools, that you know nothing about him, so I'll have to tell you about him. And of course, some of you, the better educated ones, might have heard things about, say, Jesus' seminar, which tells you convincingly that we know nothing about him. This is nonsense. We actually know quite a bit. What do we know? What is, in some sense, historically certain? Historically certain is that Jesus Christ was born in Nazareth. Why are we certain about it? Because, you see, nobody would make it up. That was an utterly unknown place of which nobody heard. And when they heard, they said, well, nothing good could come out of it. This is a quote from one of Jesus' disciples, by the way. Uh, Nathaniel, when he was told that somebody great came from Nazareth, he said, nothing good comes from Nazareth. So this is clearly a historical fact. What else do we know about him? Well, he was a construction worker, tecton. Sometimes it's translated as carpenter. But there was very little wood. So mostly it was construction work, making houses, doing, I mean. And he was very poor. How poor? Well, it's pretty clear he was homeless. When asked by someone, could I follow you, he answered, I have no place to sleep. Nowadays, we would call such a person homeless. Right? So he did not have much weight in society. And again, you, know, you cannot imagine anybody making it up because throughout the world, whether it was Judea, there was Greece, where there was Rome, homeless paupers were not much appreciated. Yes, they still are not. If you say someone is a construction worker without a permanent place of residence, that will not endear him to most people. Yes. But we do know that it's true because literally who would make it up? And the testimony is quite consistent about it. So we know when he started his public ministry, when he appeared to the world. Again, he appeared to the world when he came to be baptized by John the Baptist, a Jewish prophet. Jews do not recognize him, but they did at that time, uh, who was baptizing people next to the Jordan. So Jesus was baptized, which created somewhat of a difficulty with his disciples later on. How come Jesus needs to be baptized? But he was. This is a solid testimony that he was baptized by John the Baptist. And after that, he started his public ministry, wandering through little villages in Galilee, going from place to place, and doing two things healing people and teaching people. You say, well, healing people, these Christians made it up. Well, interestingly enough, Jewish rabbis say he did, except he was using some Egyptian magic for that. Right? So it's clearly what was happening. So he was walking around. He collected a bunch of disciples, again, historically incorrect controvertible fact, because who would make it up? Who would make up such a bunch? They were fishermen, one of the most despised 
people, people who couldn't even keep the law because they couldn't keep the Sabbath. I mean, they were just rejects. If you think about Jewish society, people of the land, Am Haaretz, they were despised. It's the learned rabbis who were respectable. He does not recruit learned rabbis. He recruits people who are totally marginalized. They're either fishermen or even worse, tax collectors. These are people who collaborate with Romans collecting money. So these are the people he surrounds himself with. Twelve of them become his primary disciples, about 70. Altogether, a small group. It's not a large sect. Right? So he wanders around Galilee, and then eventually, it's again a historically certain fact, he leads his disciple toward Judea, toward Jerusalem. We will talk a little more about it. But right now, let us just look at what actually transpires. He goes into Jerusalem. And immediately, the powers that be, the chief priests, the scholars of the law, decide that that cannot be tolerated. This person has to be exterminated, literally exterminated. So he is arrested by the Jewish authorities, which is, again, seems to be incontrovertible because they, however late, uh, sources admitted that he was judged by the Jewish court. But they do not kill him. They give him to Pontius Pilate, a cruel Roman governor. We know about Pontius Pilate from other sources. And again, it seems to be incontroversial, incontrovertible, that uh, Pilate really doesn't want to do much about it. But there are pressures. You know, the bunch of Jews come and scream, crucify him, crucify him. He orders crucifixion. So again. Jesus is killed by the Romans. On Friday, day before Saturday, again, solid historical fact. Now, here we come to another solid historical fact that Christians say that after, on the third day, which is early on Sunday morning, the tomb became empty and he rose from the dead. Our Jewish friends say, well, Christians stole the body and start, that's what they say till today, and started distributing this propaganda based on stolen body. Be it as it may, that's a historic fact. The tomb is empty. Whether you believe these people or those people, it's your choice. These are two stories which, which do survive. So again, the essential thing that what we know is that after sort of some time preaching, he goes to Jerusalem, is, is brutally murdered. Again, crucifixion is the most cruel death known to Romans. It was reserved for slaves, Roman citizens, couldn't be crucified. Well, of course, you say, but Caligula, yeah, that Roman emperors who broke their own laws. It was, in general, reserved for slaves and considered to be the worst punishment known, known, to, known to rather brutal empire. They had lots of punishment. Uh, it seems to be that while typically it would take a long time for people to die on the cross, that was designed to be a very slow and painful death, Jesus did not last very long. Again, 
all the accounts tell us about rather terrible torture inflicted by Pilate before the crucifixion. Terrible Roman flogging, which probably caused huge loss of blood, uh, which sort of assured that before the end of the day, Jesus was dead. So why did they kill him? What is that he said which forced his own people and without a doubt, Jesus Christ is the most famous Jew ever. Now, I mean, obviously since billions of people follow him, uh, he is, this is a historical fact. So how come Jews gave him to the Roman authorities to be killed? And literally, till today, view that that was a good thing to do. It seems to be a unanimous opinion you know, in, among, among uh, the Jews. For example, even the state of Israel views any Jew who recognizes Jesus Christ to be ineligible for the law of return, a rather peculiar exception. You could believe in Mao Zedong, you could believe in Buddha. You cannot believe in Jesus Christ. <coughs> From the point of view of Jewish state, that excludes you from being a Jew. Yes? Interesting. So let us see what he taught. Some of you might have heard about inauguration speech he made. There are multiple versions of that speech given in the Gospels. In the Gospel of Matthew, it is called, or at least presented, a Sermon on the Mount. So, because he goes to the mountain and talks to people. Uh, Gospel of Luke gives us very similar sermon on the plain, so sermon on the plain. Whether it's the same sermon but presented differently by different gospels, or whether he gave similar sermons twice, it actually does not matter. Right? Again, people were asking me before the class how historical are the gospels. They are very historical in exactly the framework which I described to you. Uh, in terms of when this or that particular speech was given by Jesus is very clearly, it's not historical. It was not intended to be. The authors of the Gospels were taking this outline of his ministry and putting different fragments of whatever the stories they knew into this framework. So Luke and Matthew put it differently. So. What does he say? He starts with absolutely impossible words. He says, blessed are the poor. And then he continues, blessed are you who are hungry. And then he continues, blessed are you who are crying. And then he says, blessed are you who are persecuted. And then, just to make sure that you get it, he continues, and woe to you, the rich, and woe to you who are well fed now, and then woe to you who are smiling and rejoicing now, and then woe to you if people praise you. These are astonishing words, especially if you look at the Greek. The word for poor is a much harsher word in Greek, ptochos, which means a beggar, somebody who is crouching down there asking for money. These hungry people whom you see in India, in some parts of Latin America, who have nothing. 
That's what he means. He doesn't mean, oh, poor programmer who could not afford a house in Los Altos Hill. That's not what he means. He means truly. The people at the very bottom of the society, and he says that they are the blessed. And whom does he mean by the rich? Oh, most likely he means us. Right? Well, he means Trump as well. But you don't have to own whatever, two, four, or $10 billion, whatever Trump has, to get into that. Because what rich means is a person who is secure, the person who knows his future sort of, because he says, well, I have a couple of million in the bank. You know, I could make it. No. You say, well, he couldn't possibly mean it. Yes, it's very, very clear that he meant just that, because one of the most important early Christian documents, the letter to the James, he has a rather remarkable passage talking about the rich people. I have to read it because obviously you're not going to believe me if I just quote it from memory. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are Garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded. And their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. And then comes the central message of that, that passage. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Who is the righteous person? Well, there is absolutely no doubt that in the early Christian context, it means Jesus Christ. So it is the rich who killed Jesus Christ. I know that it's not what you hear on television. You hear that, you know, Christianity is something which protects the you know, wealthy classes against the people who come from Mexico. That is not so, at least not according to the texts which, which, which we have. Uh, this, this is, uh, you know, again, I realize that it might not be pleasing to you. I realize that it might contradict your deeply held political beliefs. but. Again, they're clearly Christianity up front with the first word says, these people are evil. They represent something terrible. We will we'll see more of that. So if we look, and again, sort of what I'm going to demonstrate, that in some sense Christianity is utterly unacceptable by a modern person. That somebody reasonable, I don't want to name names, but there are lots of reasonable people I see in front of me, will say, no, it cannot be true because you know I just hate things like that. I hate being poor, I hate being chaste, I hate being humble. And the center of Christianity is precisely these three things. When we look at what Jesus says about fundamental things, that, again, let us concentrate on three things. First, a very important issue of marriage. And again, I know that the society has opinions about it, but let's see what Jesus says. Rabbis come to him and ask him, could one divorce his wife? 
nowadays you, you have to ask, could one divorce his or her wife? But at that time it was just his wife. So, and this was a trick question. In the sense, obviously they were trying, trying to, to show that he does not follow the law. And he says, so what does the law say? He asks them, and they say, oh, Moses allows us to give a letter of divorce. Jews call it git. You write a you know, piece of paper which says that you're getting rid of your wife, and she goes. And here Jesus comes with this amazing answer. He says, because of your hard-heartedness, Moses allowed that. It was not so from the beginning. In the beginning, God made man and woman to be one flesh, and they cannot be separated. His disciples are utterly astonished. They ask him, then it's better not to get married. Well, many of you probably say that. You know, if I'm stuck with whatever wife and she cannot cook well, I mean, you know, which is a perfectly legitimate reason for a Jew to get rid of his wife. It's a weak, I mean, who could be married? And he says, utterly astonishing things. What does he say? He says, yes, there are eunuchs. You know, eunuchs? People, nothing to do with the parading system. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, there are eunuchs who are born like so. There are eunuchs who are made so by men. And then he says, there are eunuchs who made themselves so for the sake of the kingdom. That is, what he says is that sometimes the full denial of sexual relations is the way to go. But then he continues, but only those who could, can, who could do it. Not everyone can do it. Terrible things. Disciples are horrified. It's actually there. It's very interesting. Disciples in the Gospels come across as a really stupid bunch. They, they never understand what Jesus tells them and usually contradict, because the message is harsh. The message is utterly unacceptable by modern men, even 2,000 years ago. It's unpleasant. You know, you cannot divorce your, your wife, or maybe live like a monk. Then comes the second point. This is, again, it appears if you look at the Gospel of Mark, the first Gospel, which is written, it all appears right next to each other in chapter 10, where sort of he's going to Jerusalem, he tells them what is going to happen to Jerusalem, and he tells them the central pieces of his teaching. So first, sex. The second is, of course, you say drugs, no, money. What happens is that a fellow, rich fellow, comes to him and asks, how do I obtain eternal life? How do I become good? Huh? And Jesus said, keep the commandments. Do not steal, do not commit adultery. And the man, Matthew says, the young man, uh, in Mark, young is missing. Uh, so the, the, the man says, all these I kept from my youth. That's why I think Matthew makes him young. I kept from my youth. And Jesus looks at him and loves him. Somehow, there is something good in him. He says, there is some hope. And he says, then go, sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. Very direct, but rather harsh words. Everything you have. So, and the man went away, said, because, as the gospel says, 
he had many possessions. Again, and this is again sort of what, what follows. Follows the conversation between Jesus and his disciples. What does he tell them? He says, it's, hard, it's harder for a camel, camel is a large animal, to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to get to the kingdom of heaven. And he doesn't just mean people with billions. It's very clear that this is a harsh, again, harsh statement which challenges us, which challenges people who are comfortable. And again, disciples are astonished. And then the third point, the point again, which, which sort of completes the thing. Remember, chastity, poverty, and obedience. These are three what, what historically known evangelical counsels. That's what Jesus says. These are good things for you to have. Huh? So we cover two. And then, of course, these disciples start arguing. What do they always argue about? How to feed the poor? No. They always argue about one subject. Who is number one? Who is going to be the most important of them? That both. So one of them is going to be the director, or the VP, or whatever you want to call him. Right? And they argue. And again, sort of, what happens? They come, actually, they come to him in Mark, it's James and John, two of the disciples, come to him. Matthew makes it a little nicer. He makes their mother, their brothers, he, he sends their mother to, to talk to Jesus. But I think it was them. Mother might have been around, but I think they came and said, could we sit on the right and the left of you when you are in your kingdom? Because they're certain that he is you know, going to rule. He's going to take Jerusalem. He's going to be the king of the Jews. And one of them will be sitting on the right, and another is going to be sitting on the left. Jesus is not receptive. He says, it's not up to me. And in any case, what you could do, you could drink my cup, what he means. You could, you know, if you want to be crucified, you could get that. But you are not to be like kings of the nations. You are not to be important. You are not to strive to be a VP. You are not to strive even to make it to a director or a principal scientist. Because if you want to be my disciple, you have to be the servant of all. Again, what is the message? The message is utterly contrary to whatever we are bound to do we are bound to strive because, you know. Uh, this was a really somehow disturbing message. It was a disturbing message for the Jewish authorities because they clearly realized somehow that there is no future. I mean, for them, for the power structure, for the Jews, you know, he tells not to resist evil. He says, do love your enemies, even Romans, even Donald Trump, even whomever. I mean, you know, whatever people whom we find objectionable, we have to love. We have to try to see something truly precious in them. It's very, very hard because, as Jesus says, it's easy to love your own. It's easy to love your friends. Try to love Arabs. That is truly hard. Or Mexicans, when they come here, that is very hard. But he says that we must do it. And again, power structure from that time 
till the modern time, of course, finds it unacceptable. Of course, we will have to somehow reconcile it with the fact that power structure became Christian eventually. But nevertheless, if you read the text, the text is clearly directed against them. It clearly sends a message that those in power crucified him. It's not just Jewish authorities, it was the Roman authorities which actually crucified him. These were Roman soldiers who took him to the cross. So, originally, Roman Empire viewed it as the most terrible superstition. The first, roughly speaking, 300 years, it's a crime against the state. You know, they catch you and they feed you to the lions. And with huge popular support, people run around screaming Christians to the lions. I mean, great fun, you know. They provide entertainment. And uh, for about 300 years, they follow one after another terrible persecutions. And by the way, I have to acknowledge that Often, the good emperors, the emperors who were trying to establish sort of rule of law, were actively persecuting Christians. It was not that only people like Nero, of course, the first great persecution, started with Nero, who was a sick, mentally sick person, I mean, truly crazy, uh, and, you know, he was in charge of the persecution in which Peter of Humio should have heard, but in any case, he was the first, the most important apostle. And Paul, of whom he will be talking later in the course, uh, apostle to the Gentiles, the person who actually started this movement, which converted all the Greeks and Romans to Christianity, both of them perished under Nero. But persecutions come and come and come for 300 years. Persecutions are sort of every 30 years, they're a major wave. It's eventually they organize it sort of when probably Nero was doing it, they were just, they were using informers to, to catch Christians. Eventually they developed a wonderful, wonderful system. Uh, you had everybody who was not exempt, Jews were exempt, had to offer sacrifice to the emperor's cult. Emperor was God, remember? So Christians couldn't. They didn't believe that emperor was a god. Uh, and you need to get a certificate. It was very simple. You, you came, you paid three dollars, you know, you <coughs> offered libation, you got a certificate. We have this certificate, some of them are extant. It's amazing. And then, sort of, you could go free. Uh, many Christians refused. So time and time again, there were mass exterminations. There are lots of people called martyrs. Martyr means witness. So they witnessed that they were following Jesus against his very clear statement was that if you want to be my follower, what are you to do? Take up your cross and follow me. So this is not an easy path. And how do you know that you follow him? Literally by, is there a cross? You follow him. You're having it all easy? No matter what you say, you're not a follower. So then they had a really easy task to prove to themselves that they were following Jesus Christ. They refused this piece of paper. By the way, it keeps going till, you know, I used to live in a country which had a very similar system of uh, catching Christians. And again, many people would gladly take them to the lions or concentration camps. Uh, so it, it's, still, it's still done. So this was over. We will talk about 
sort of this change uh, by early fourth century when finally after the most terrible of the persecutions, the persecution by Diocletian, a great emperor, truly restorer of Roman Empire. Uh, but uh, he also, you know, he had to have law and order. And law and order meant getting rid of Christians. And he was very, very effective. There were most terrible persecutions. But after, or roughly speaking, 10 years, it was clear that the empire sort of couldn't kill them all. They, were, they killed a lot, but uh, there were sort of popular indignation. By the way, the amazing thing that these persecutions were effective means of spreading Christianity. A great Christian apologist, Tertullian, in his apology writes, the blood of Christians is the seed of Christianity. And so it happened. By the end of Diocletian persecution in the wealthy parts of Eastern Empire, which became the center of the Roman Empire, West was sort of fading away uh, economically. In large cities, 40, sometimes maybe even 50% of the people were Christians. Not in the villages, but Clearly, Christianity survived the persecution and spread throughout empire. Now, the remarkable fact, which we will have to understand, that within, roughly speaking, 15 years after the death of Jesus Christ, Christianity became a Greek religion. All the books in the New Testament are written in Greek. And very often, they are very clearly written to the Greek-speaking non-Jewish population. How do we know? Well, I mean, when there are sentences such as, Jews do this and that, that clearly means that the reader is not Jewish and actually is not even familiar with basic Jewish customs. Right? And Mark, the first of the Gospels, clearly has sentences like that. So by the f sort of year, say, 45, the mission to the Jews fails completely. There are still founding members of the church, people like Peter, people like Paul, who are Jews, but church becomes effectively Greek. It's the Greeks, it's the people who, in some sense, were prepared Christianity by people like Plato. Remember, I mean, when we were talking about Plato, we talked about this remarkable passage in the Republic where they discuss what will happen when the truly just person is born. And the answer is, his own people will betray him. He's going to be scourged, blinded, and crucified. A rather unusual punishment for Plato. Should have been asked to drink poison. But in many respects, Greeks apparently were prepared to accept Christianity. Jews were not. We will have to discuss it because this is, this is a truly amazing historical fact that there was a universal rejection of Jesus Christ by the Jews. There is no question about it, you know, no matter what uh, some German historians tried to prove uh, in the 30s that Jesus Christ was Jewish. It's central to his identity. But it's equally interesting that till today he is universally rejected by his people. It's a historical fact which needs to be explained next lecture. 
I will try to explain that when we look at the story of Paul. Because Paul was the person who actually attempted to convert the Jews. He failed. So we will find out what, what happened in the next lecture. Uh, the title is Jesus of Nazareth.